tonight. Thank you. You may be seated. I don't know who all is listening today, but uh, wish you Godspeed till the storm passes by. Amen. And every storm eventually passes by. One of the most common phrases in the Bible is, it came to pass. And this also will pass. And life itself will pass. And someday those who have been sowing to the Spirit, as we talked about in the Sunday School lesson, will be gathered together on that beautiful shore when the storm has passed by. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is where we're at. Uh, as you remember, in chapter 12, we talked about Paul instructing them concerning good and bad spirituality, pneumaticos, uh, true and false, good and bad. Chapter 13 talked about the essence of good spirituality, which is God's law of love, the principle of love, which is God's very nature and outlook and the way he operates, his mode of operation is love, benevolence, unselfish love. And there's no way to learn the parameters of that except by God's law, God's Word. A lot of people think they know what love is, but God's Word is where you learn the uh, principles of love. Now, before we go into chapter 14, which has been one of the most abused chapters in the Bible, let's, let's remind ourselves of the context. Number one, Paul strongly implies that there were imposters in Corinth who were faking spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, or spirituality, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, consider and think a while by why he had to say that. In 1 Corinthians 14, 36 and 38, What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Okay, there's no doubt that Paul was speaking and dealing with imposters in Corinth, who were claiming spirituality and claiming spiritual gifts. Okay, that's beyond debate. Number two, Paul is regulating the misuse of these professed gifts, which shows that what was happening at Corinth was not a phenomena of the Holy Ghost, but of human abuse. If it was a phenomena of the Holy Spirit, no man would be regulating it. Number three, the gifts of tongues is everywhere in the scripture definite languages spoken by some nation or people in every case of the legitimate use of the gift of tongues there was someone who understood what was spoken it wasn't an unknown or unknowable gibberish okay if you turn to acts 2 quickly to just lay the foundation stone here Acts chapter 2 verse 4 And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Those people were not there praying for the gift of tongues. They were not practicing the gift of tongues. They were not coaching one another as Pentecostals do today. This was a phenomenon of the Holy Ghost and no apostle would have dared try to regulate it or rebuke it or control it. Okay? It was God doing something. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, <coughs> devout men, out of every nation under heaven because... They came from every nation in the Roman Empire for the day of Pentecost, okay? They were from all different lands, Jews, proselytes, it names them all. Now, when this was noised abroad, because it took place probably in an upper room in the temple, uh, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man? in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt 
and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues, plural, the wonderful works of God. Okay, now, there's a number of things that can be easily deduced from this, and that is that the gift of tongues, it says they were all filled, and all these which speak, and it talks about them which were speaking, and these men, they, they, Peter said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. Okay, there were many speakers. There wasn't just one person. It was not a gift of hearing. If it were a gift of hearing, nobody would have known anything was spoken but their own language, because that's all they would have heard. Okay, a gift of hearing doesn't mean I'm hearing all these different languages. That, that's not a gift of hearing, okay? It, what, some people believe that that the people all spake in gibberish and everybody heard it in their own language. But if that had been so, they would have not known any other language was being spoken. It's not an ecstatic utterance heard by each differently. That, that can be easily proven by what is said here. It's not ecstatic utterances interpret, interpreted afterwards. That didn't happen here. Okay? There's not ecstatic utterances interpreted by someone other than yourself. Uh, they didn't get up and somebody give a gibberish and someone else interpret it in the common language of the people. That's not what happened. Although that's what happens in Pentecostal churches, the faith gifts. Those around were edified. It was for others' edification. It wasn't a angelic language for self-edification uh, that, that was a bunch of nonsense that's made up by charismatics nobody dared regulate it it did not produce confusion but was very productive it wasn't sought for prayed for coached or practiced most of you have probably never read Pentecostal and charismatic books they have uh, they have charismatic camps where you go and get coached in how to learn to speak with tongues, okay? You're not learning another language. You're learning to just let your tongue fly and believe that God is doing something. It is the most nonsense. Uh, it's hard, be hard to find something more nonsensical. Now, obviously here, the big miracle was that Galileans were supernaturally enabled to speak languages of all these countries. Okay, uh, there was, okay, how many were in the upper room? 120? There was the, the 12 disciples. There was the 70 other disciples that Jesus sent out. We know at least them are, they are preachers, at least. Some of them were women, but we know there was at least 70 plus the disciples, which were 12. Now, um, so you have 82 possible speakers. Was there 82 languages? No, there's not quite 82 languages there, is there? So you know that there were certain who spoke this language, there were certain who spoke this language, and all these different languages were being spoken by individuals, but nobody was speaking all of them. Nobody was, you, it's impossible. This is a very practical situation. So, somebody standing there, he's from uh, Mesopotamia, he hears someone saying, speaking his language. He may understand a few of the languages because these people were usually at least bilingual. Okay, they came and they could at least converse with one another there in Jerusalem. They could probably speak Aramaic, Syriac, uh, but they also spoke the, the home tongue of where they were living. And so they're all practicing Jews and they would know Syriac or what people call Aramaic uh, because they were Jews and that would be the language spoken in the synagogues most likely or at least when they went back for the feast they had to know that language but then they also knew their home language whether they were from Arabia uh, Accretion uh, you know Libya whatever and so they would hear these Galileans and these Gal this is Gal here's a Galilean here praising God probably with a Galilean accent in Libya in Libyan or the language of Mesopotamia. And they were like, wow, this, this is really something. They, could, they knew enough to know these are all Galileans. Then how are they speaking in all these different languages? Um, 
And that was the miracle. Now, if you go to where Cornelius, when the Gentiles were grafted in, in Acts 10, you have Cornelius and those with him. The Holy Ghost is poured upon them as on the disciples in Acts 2. And they began to speak with other languages and glorify God. Now, the people who said they were glorifying God were Jews. There was Peter and, and six others. There were seven Jewish witnesses that witnessed Gentiles glorifying God in, another, in a tongue they hadn't learned. But the Jews understood it. Most likely Syriac, Aramaic, which or uh, that was more or less what was spoken by the Hebrew people at that time. It's a it's a dialect of Hebrew, and so um, the uh, the most common sense interpretation is that Jews were enabled powerfully by the Holy Spirit to speak Gentile languages. What's the obvious? reason to spread the gospel over the gentile world right and the gentiles when the holy ghost fell upon them most likely were able to speak in the aramaic hebrew that the jews were used to because that that's how the jews understood it and knew that it was special different and what is he doing here he's bringing together the jew the gentiles grafted into the jewish vine and the the remnant church going out into all the world to preach the gospel. So this was a very important gift, a powerful gift, and um, it helped immensely in the spreading of the gospel. I don't know, Paul said he speaks in tongues more than y'all. Now, how many different languages he could speak in, we don't know, but that would be very convenient. He went all over the Roman Empire preaching to the people, and that would be very handy. Okay, so the gift of tongues were definite languages. In 1 Corinthians 14, 21, which we will get to, it says, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues or languages and other lips will I speak unto this people, the Jews, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, Paul says, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, not to the Jews that become Christians, but to them that believe not, the unbelieving Jews, the unbelieving Israel, and what it speaks to them is that this group that is following Jesus of Nazareth, the sect of the Nazarenes, has supernatural gifts. And they can supernaturally, by God's help, speak in other people's languages. And that is a rebuke to Judaism, which did not have the, that power and the spiritual gifts that uh, God was giving to these people. Okay. Now, understand that what is happening in Acts here is called prophesying. They, they began to speak with other tongues, and it calls it prophesying. Because when I speak the words of God in a language you understand, okay, even if it's a supernatural uh, gift of tongues, okay, if you're Spanish, I don't know Spanish, and suddenly I can witness to you in Spanish, that's a gift of tongues. But what I'm doing is prophesying because you're understanding it. And in the book of, in 1 Corinthians 14, he distinguishes between the gift of tongues to no purpose, or the gift of tongues to prophesy, or just prophesying in a language you know. Prophesying is speaking unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. In other words, I'm communicating God's word to you. Whereas in, in Corinth, they were using a real or supposed gift of tongues, to no purpose. There was no communication going on. And that was the foolishness of it all. Um, so let's move on to 1 Corinthians. Now, there is a group of, of belief, a belief system that believes that these supernatural gifts, these revelatory gifts, the, the supernatural ability to speak in an unlearned language, uh, the Holy Spirit giving us direct knowledge before the scriptures are produced, the gift of knowledge uh, and these different things were rel revelatory gifts that were in the church given to special uh, people, not just to anybody uh, and everybody, but to those who were spiritually mature. But cessationists who believe that these special gifts ceased to operate in the New Testament church as they did in the apostolic church. And when the apostolic oversight was gone, the evidence is that these special revelatory gifts ceased. 
Well, when the, when the apostles were gone, the word of God was also complete. And so this needed to become the authority over and above anybody's gift. Okay? Now that's called cessation. There are all the Charismatics and Pentecostals a rail against it. But, proof. All of their missionaries have to learn languages before they go to the mission field. If cessation is wrong, none of their missionaries should be learning languages. Okay? And the Pentecostals could go and become missionaries all, all over the place without any language schools. They all have to have language school. Every denomination, regardless of their claims, all send their missionaries to language schools to learn languages. Now, that proves that these supernatural revelatory gifts ceased with the death of the apostles. Yep. Now, God can miraculously, in certain instances, give somebody for healing or give somebody with a special vision or understanding for a special supernatural uh, purpose of direction, like, get out of here quick, okay? God can do that, like he told Joseph and Mary to get up and flee to Egypt. There have been many stories of Christians in, in persecuted under communism and so forth that God spoke to someone and said, get out of here, and they obeyed, and it was just in time. I'm not, I'm not refuting any of that. I'm talking about the the gifts of the common the commonness of these gifts among the believers in the churches okay obviously in the apostolic church it was common for people to have these gifts and so otherwise for someone to go into Corinth and claim it would have been really odd and nobody would have believed them it was common okay but it's not common now and Paul's dealing with it in chapter 13 <clears throat> gave the principle that when that which is more uh, complete and mature is come, that which is less complete and less mature is done away. Um, as, as the scriptures were completed, as the gospel was established, okay, these supernatural gifts became less and less common, in fact, almost never heard of, just like after Moses and Joshua and all the supernatural things that happened there in the establishment of the law, after Moses died and Joshua died, it was pretty well normalcy, except for little, little pop-ups of different uh, supernatural uh, gifts and a different prophet or this or that, but it wasn't common in Israel, uh, even for that. So, let's move on. <clears throat> Verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy. Now when you hear that, uh, think of communicate God's word. Okay? Because that's what he's referring to. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, an unknown to the congregation or even unknowable, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, the charismatics want to believe that Paul is giving credit to this. Paul is actually rebuking it. Okay? He says, he's not speaking unto men. He's not communicating with people. Only God knows what he's thinking as he's, as he's jabbering. Or as he's, even if, it's a, even if this was a true gift of another language. If the people in the congregation don't understand it, then he, all he's doing is talking to God because God's the only man, only one who can understand him. He says, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries because it's unintelligible, it's unknowable. Okay? Now, in this situation, if, if Isaiah was a fraud, and I was just an immature Christian, if I really had the gift of speaking in uh, um, Latin, that I hadn't learned, but Isaiah here, he's, he's an imposter from the idol temple. He's here just to, to like a Simon Magus type of fellow, okay? One to deceive people. Now, for me to get up and speak to the congregation in Latin, knowing that nobody here understood it, and I had a legitimate gift, that would be immature at best. Mm -hmm. It would make it very easy for someone like him to get up and fake a, uh, a, a language or an ecstatic utterance and say, this is a spiritual gift. 
And for the most part, nobody can really tell much of the difference because it's both foolishness. And so Paul, I think, is, is dealing with both of these possibilities in his regulations. He would regulate both of these people out of business by his regulations. Paul is, is not lend, lending credence, okay? Verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. In other words, this is productive. The other is unproductive. Uh, speaking in a known tongue, or if, if I don't know the language of the congregation and I get an interpreter up here, because he knows my language and their language, uh, then I can prophesy because somebody's interpreting it, okay? Verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And Paul had already said, let all things be done unto edifying. And he also said in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, to profit the church. Um, verse 5. I would that ye all spake with <clears throat> tongues, or were bilingual, or trilingual, or how, whatever, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Okay? So if the guy with another language can interpret or has an interpreter, then he can communicate. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're not communicating. And Paul is showing that that is nothing but carnal display and uh, could be fraudulent. It's one or the other. It's either a total fraud or it's an immature use of something you know and you're just trying to, to exhibit it and you're not really doing anything positive. Verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? Now, we don't know exactly how he distinguishes between the two, but in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says... All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I'm not sure how he would categorize all these differently, but we know, basically, doctrine is what's right, reproof is what's wrong, correction is how to get right, and instruction is how to stay right. And all of that needs to be incorporated in our communication in the church. But he says here, Unless I'm speaking to you basically something, unless I'm communicating to you by revelation or knowledge or prophesying or doctrine, unless I'm communicating to you, I am not profiting you at all. And that's what these uh, imposters are doing. They're not profiting. They're displaying. It's an exhibit for the purpose of glory and gaining influence. Verse 7, And even things without life giving sound whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, in other words, something that nobody's familiar with, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Okay? When it says, for... In the spirit he speaketh mysteries. It's the same word as air, mm -hmm. pneuma. All right? So in other words, he's saying, look, <clears throat> this is common sense. The spiritual gifts were given to profit with all. The spiritual gifts were given for edifying the church. The spiritual gifts were not given to exhibit me, myself, my glory, to, to display something just for personal benefit. Okay? That's not what the spiritual gifts were given for. They were not given for people to play with like toys. And they were not given for people to display. So the display itself indicates imposter. It indicates a fraud. God's ways are very practical. Verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices or languages in the world, and none of them is without signification or distinct meaning. In other words, all languages have a distinct meaning to somebody. Somebody understands every single language. There's not an unknowable language or something that's claimed to be an angelic language is a fraud. He said the only languages that, that he is, in the context of his thinking of this, 
They are distinct languages somewhere. Therefore, if I know not the meaning, okay, the word meaning goes back to signification, a distinct meaning. If I know not the meaning of the voice or language, I shall be to him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. It's very clear that he's regulating frauds out of business. Okay? He's showing that this false display is inappropriate. It's not what the Spirit of God is wanting to do. It's not what God is doing. And therefore, they need to stop it. And you need to stop listening to him. You need to stop oohing and awe on Adam. And you need to tell him to sit down and hush. And Paul's going to basically say that before long. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. That's a nice way of saying, look, if you really want to share something in the church, figure out what your language is and speak to us in our language. Or shut up. <clears throat> For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, my understanding refers to my being understood. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. You'll see that. There's no way to miss it in the context. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my being understood is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with I will pray with the spirit, but I will also be understood. Okay? I will pray with the understanding also. I will, in other words, speak from my spirit in a language others understand. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, in other words, I know that I'm blessing, but my tongue is not speaking any language that you will understand. Okay, I know, in my mind, I'm saying, praise God. You have no idea what I'm saying. So, else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how should he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. For thou verily in your mind give thanks well, but the other is not edified because you're not communicating. You see that? Mm -hmm. I, in other words, so he says, I'm going to speak with both my spirit and be understood. That's the way to do it. Otherwise, you're really being foolish. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church... I had rather speak five words with my understanding. In other words, that you can understand me. That by my voice, I might teach others also. That's what with my understanding means. He just showed us right there. Okay? With my understanding, that by my voice, I might teach others also. Then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Unknown to the congregation. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. It's very clear what he's saying here, if, mm -hmm. if people aren't already biased for their own ism. Now, the amen in the Jewish and early church congregations was highly esteemed. It showed the common consent and unity of the congregation. They said a hearty amen together at the end of prayer. Okay? So, he says, Thou ver how, sh how are they going to say amen at thy giving of thanks? Well, when you understand how important the amen was, you understand more what he's saying. Clark says it was very frequent in primitive times to express their approbation in the public assemblies by amen. This practice, soberly and piously conducted, might still be of great use in the Church of Christ. I think the church that he was in was a little too straight-laced and wouldn't have appreciated it as much, but he puts that in there nonetheless. Okay? He also says... This response was of the highest authority and merit among the Jews. They even promised the remission of sins, the annihilation of the sentence of damnation, and the opening of the gates of paradise to those who fervently say amen. And it is one of their maxims that greater is he who says amen than he who prays. The pulpit commentary says, The sound of a loud, unanimous amen of early Christian congregations is compared to the echo of distant thunder. Being the answer of the congregation, the Amen was regarded as no less important than the prayer itself. Now, so, if the early Christian congregations unanimously together at the end of a prayer said, Amen, 
and during the teaching would say amen then for someone to get up with some unknown to, to, to give some unknown language the, the natural thing is how are we going to say amen to that we don't know but what he's calling Jesus accursed we don't know what he's saying and Paul is going along that same train of thought so he says I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children. There's three different words here. Be not little school children in understanding. In malice be ye infants, but in understanding be men of maturity. Verse 21, he says, In the law it is written, For men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And he goes on to say that tongues were for a sign to Israel. Um, he says here, Wherefore tongues were for a sign, not to them that believe, not to Christians who believe in the Messiah, but to them that believe not, unbelieving Israel. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, unbelieving Israel, but for them that believe, those who are in the church. Okay? It edifies the church. Now, over 700 years before, in Isaiah 28, 11 to 12, this prophecy is given. And it was fulfilled in the Babylonian tongue, where God's judgment dealt with their pride. They would not listen to the prophets in their own tongue, so God says, you're going to listen to your master with a whip in another tongue. And this was a way of, of rebuking them. But this was also a subtle prophecy of something yet to come. It was by, by, by this same way God was rebuking unbelieving Israel for not accepting the Messiah verse 23 if therefore the whole church become together into one place and all speak with tongues improperly okay in other words we're, we're all displaying a language we know or we're all just we're, you know all the frauds are given their gibberish or whatever their unknowable tongue and there come in those who are unlearned not Christians or unbelievers Will they not say ye are mad? In other words, don't you see the utter foolishness in what you're doing? Don't you see the utter foolishness of being in a congregation of English-speaking people and standing up here and speaking Russian? What would be the purpose? Oh, the purpose would be to show you that I know Russian and you don't. What other purpose is there? Mm -hmm. That's foolishness. Okay? And if everybody, if we were all... Uh, linguistically inclined to where we all had you know Russian and Chinese and Japanese and Korean and all the different and we all just sat and and displayed our languages someone's gonna say you guys are a bunch of idiots this is ridiculous this is there's nothing productive here this is all a show it's a fraud and they would be right but he says if all prophesy now prophesy <laughs> is speaking is communicating with one another the words of God we're discussing principles of God's Word where we can understand one another but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or an, un, uh, an unlearned in other words a visitor from outside uh, maybe a neighbor or someone you've invited a seeker he is convinced or that word elenco reproved or convicted of all he is judged he's examined he's scrutinized of all by the principles that are discussed Okay, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Now, we have experienced similar things to this. We've had people visiting family, and their, their family visitors come and sit in church. One time we were singing, There Are Two Ways. And they got so convicted and upset, they walked out. We didn't even get to the sermon yet. Just, the, just being in the presence singing the songs. Maybe there was some discussion in Sunday school. I forget exactly how that went. But they, they didn't wait for this. They just walked out. Everybody's like, oh, wonder what happened there. There's, there was one man who was secretly uh, being double-faced here, trying to, trying to act like he was with us, but he was not with us. And every time we came to have communion, he got sick and had to leave. You know, God has many ways of trying to expose phonies, and it's really sad because if I was sitting in a church and they were discussing God's Word, 
and it was stabbing me. Okay? It was rebuking me. It was scrutinizing me. It was exposing my selfishness. It was exposing my pride because of the principles of God's Word, the words of the apostles and so forth. I felt like God was pointing His finger at me. If I was honest, if I wasn't a rebel, then I would do what it says here. Okay? And thus are the secrets of their heart made manifest, and falling down, they'll repent and worship God and, ex and, and acknowledge that God is here. God is speaking. This is the goal. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation from their own experience. They have, they have something to share as they come together. They've been walking with God all week. He says, let all things be done unto edifying. There. That ruler right there just shut down the phonies. Let all things, whatever you do, you've got to do it to where you're edifying the church. There's no such thing as a virtue in self-edification. Well, tongues are for self-edification. I've heard charismatic say that. And I said, uh, if you only understood what he was saying when he said that, you know. You don't edify the church, you only edify yourself. I can, I can do all kinds of silly things in gibber and jabber and, and speak unintelligible words and claim that I'm edifying myself. But that's, it's very immature. And he says, let's be men. Let's be mature. Verse 27. Uh, verse 26. Uh, so we're on verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue. In other words, if anybody, that's the only tongue he can speak in. He cannot speak in the tongue of the congregation. He comes in, he speaks in a tongue that's unknown to the congregation. Or, if he claims to have another tongue, whatever it be, let it be by two or at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, that has to be decided before he talks, uh -huh. not after he talks. He don't stand up in the church and give out this spreel of gibberish and then sit down and then somebody else stands up and says, this is the interpretation. That's a show. That's a fraud. Paul, if you follow Paul's regulations, before this man spoke, he had to have an interpreter. Okay? Now that interpreter, being that Paul's idea of language is not gibberish. He made me that very clear. He said there's many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without distinct meaning, signification. So gibberish is out. It's not part of Paul's idea of tongues. So if I want to speak in a congregation, but I don't know the local language, I speak in a tongue they don't know. The regulation is, number one, let all things be done to edify. If I want to speak and edify, I have to have an interpreter first. In other words, I have to find somebody uh, who speaks my language and the language of the congregation. That's what an interpreter is. So I may walk into... Uh, a bunch of gringo congregation and say, Tu hablas espanol? Nope. Okay. I can't talk then. There's no interpreter. There's no one who understands Spanish. So I got to keep quiet. <clears throat> that, that's so common. I mean, that's common sense, right? Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. In other words, in a meeting, in a service, you can have a couple different preachers. The other elders are judging and uh, saying amen or correcting. You can't do that. You can't have judgment, amen, correction, and so forth, scrutiny and accountability if you don't know what they're saying. That's clear. If anything be, be revealed to another that sits by, let the first, first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. That doesn't mean that everybody should interrupt the preacher and blurt out uh, when they want to say something. No, that's talking about the discussion that comes among brethren in a church situation. Obviously, when Paul was preaching, they weren't continuously interrupting him. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he wasn't continuously being interrupted. Those who are bishops and elders must be apt to teach. 
because that's what they're going to be doing. Then, when there's, when there's discussion time, question answer time, fellowship time, everyone wants to share what they learn from Scripture or they want to in inject into the fellowship, then they, what he's saying is, be respectful one to another. Give everyone a chance to share. Uh, give everyone a chance to inject and uh, wait for one another. Be, be courteous to one another. He says here, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So, this idea that I'm so full of the Holy Ghost, I'm just going to blurt it out. And everybody's supposed to accept it. It's rash. It's spontaneous. It's not orderly. But that, make, that means it's spiritual. That's a bunch of nonsense. Spiritual means decent and in order. Spiritual means respectful of one another. Spiritual means that if I have something to share, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I can wait my turn. I can keep my mouth shut in respect to others until it's time to speak. Okay? That's what he's saying. Obviously, there was a bunch of disorder. And there are churches today who follow the Corinthian confusion. It's just a, a revival of Corinthian confusion in these charismatic churches where someone just stands up and blurts out some gibberish hoping that someone else will stand up and interpret it. And they've been embarrassed many times by people who tested them by standing up and speaking Hebrew and sitting down. And then somebody else stands up with a supposed interpretation and says something totally different. Uh, therefore, their fraud was discovered. And yet, people keep on doing it. Um, so, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It doesn't have to be spontaneous. It doesn't have to be rash. It's not out of control. God is not the author of confusion. <clears throat> Let your women keep silence in the churches. Okay, that, that regulated that aspect out of business. If churches today would follow the regulations put on Corinth, number one, you wouldn't have people speaking out without an interpreter. You wouldn't have people speaking out for any other reason than edifying the church. Others would be able to judge what they said because it would have to be understood what they said. Others would be able to say amen because they would know whether it was true or false. The women wouldn't be talking in the church. Look, if you've ever known, you know much about charismatic churches and Pentecostal churches, that is uh, not happening. They're not keeping silent in the church. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. This is not a local uh, requirement for Corinth because of a problem. This was normal Jewish thinking. People who don't get that divorce the Bible and the apostles from their Jewish background, their Jewish roots, okay? He says, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. He didn't say, don't permit it. He said, it's not permitted. But they are commanded to be under obedience. These things are already in place. As also saith the law. What law? Moses' law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's a shame. It's a shame. That didn't just happen. That's not just for Corinth. It's a shame. That's established for women to speak in the churches. That's the way it's always been. In, in the synagogue, in the temple, there were prophetesses, no doubt. Anna was a prophetess. Did she get up and teach in the synagogue? No. Did she get up and teach in the temple? No. It was more of a personal ministry, especially among the women. So, uh, Paul is just declaring common Jewish biblical thinking. And when it comes to head covering and tongues and all these things, People who forget the Jewishness of the church always get it wrong. Verse 36, what? Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? That's pretty sharp. If I said that to someone, it would be a, a, a pretty sharp rebuke. And it would, it would imply that I was considering them arrogant to the point of foolish, okay? Their foolishness was due to arrogance. And I expected that what I was saying was not going to be well received because of their arrogance. Then I would say something like this. Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? Who do you think you are? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, 
Let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, okay, obviously he just took a shot at a certain group. Then he comes back to the brethren. Covet to prophesy. Pray to be able to prophesy. Obviously that was a gift of the Holy Spirit to understand God's Word and be able to communicate God's Word. Now, we know that that also would include seeing in, that, in the definition of prophesy. But in this context, he's talking about communicating for the edification of the church. The word prophesy also can refer to foretelling future events. But that's not primarily what he's using it for here. In this context, he gave us the definition. Speaking unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. And forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Don't forbid someone who's not, who's of a different language. Don't forbid them to come and share. Just use common sense. They need to have an interpreter. They need to be, you need to understand what they're saying so you can judge it. You need to understand what they're saying so you can rebuke it if necessary or say amen to it. Now, those who understand the, the false gifts today called tongues realize that if they followed Paul's regulations they wouldn't be doing it. He says you were led away by false pneumaticos. He says there's no virtue or spirituality in speaking a language unknown to the congregation. He says that if, before anyone speaks an unknown language to the congregation they must find an interpreter who knows their language or be quiet. Uh, what is said in a Foreign language interpreted must be judged by others. A true prophet can wait till it's an appropriate time for him to speak. And the women are not allowed to speak at all in the congregation as far as teaching, preaching, and asking questions. Um, now, people today who go to churches where false gifts are fraudulently displayed whether they're just ignorant, sincerely ignorant, a little simple-minded, or what, or whether they're the deceiver. There's always the deceiver and the deceived. And the deceiver is uh, definitely more culpable than the deceived. He's got a higher accountability, a higher damnation, but the deceived are also going to fall in the ditch. Because if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. And that's that scary business. But any deception carries with it a certain amount of fault. Because Paul laid down regulations. And as a young man who was very interested in the charismatic movement and wondered if there was something else I'm supposed to have that God hadn't given me, and I wanted it, I wanted everything God had to give, began to read and to study and to pray about it. And it became clear to me simply from the Word of God that if these people were, were of God, they'd be obeying God. God did not empower them to disobey the Bible. Spiritual gifts do not lift you above the Word of God. Now that's common sense, right? But when you come to that conclusion, you realize what they're doing is, even if there is a true gift of tongues today, that's not it. They're not following. The Spirit of God is not leading them to disobey the Bible. In fact, there was a woman one time who was telling us about the spirit that she received and she spoke in tongues. And so I questioned her. I said, uh, you just speak out in the church, yeah? I said, do you have a covering on? No. I said, so here you are claiming that you're, you've got the Holy Ghost. He's leading you to disobey the Bible in a number of places. Number one, you're speaking without an interpreter. You're a woman and you don't have your head covered. I said, I think you have an evil spirit. Well, she was highly offended at that. But I said, the Holy Ghost is not going to empower you to disobey the Bible. Anyways, you, I've probably told this story before, but she agreed to have us test her spirit. I'd never done this before, but I, uh, we started, we went over to her house one night, and we began to pray, God, would you reveal to this woman uh, whether she has an evil spirit or not? And she spoke up and said, I really had a strong urge to start speaking in tongues. I said, go ahead. She started her gibberish, 
And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, Spirit, to identify yourself. And I can tell the story, but my, only my wife was there to witness it. It was very interesting. Uh, it was hair-raising. But the voice that came out of her was not her voice. And it said, Lucifer. And I can tell you the hair on my neck stood straight up. And uh, I began saying in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord rebuke you. I command you to come out of this woman. I command you to flee in the name of Jesus. And she, she regained her composure. And then she said, I, I feel this. I feel rebellion. So we rebuke the spirit of rebellion. I feel this. I, anyway, we prayed and worked with her for quite a while. And... Uh, work through that. But it proved to me that whatever she had was not the Holy Ghost. Okay? Uh, years later, because she still she still would not come all the way. She still wanted to hang on and she didn't want to totally condemn all this religiosity that she'd been involved in. And I feared that that uh, though the house may have got cleaned, that the devil was going to come back with seven more. And it wasn't long, maybe a couple years later, she was in an insane asylum. And uh, we still corresponded with her son then, but it was just, it was a hopeless situation. So, I know that there are many spirits out there. And they like to, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, they like to masquerade as the angel, the, the devil as an angel of light, and so his ministers as ministers of righteousness. Don't doubt it. There are many spirits out there, and they're very subtle, and they know how to allure different people with different things. And false piety, false religious gifts, they've got that base covered clearly. And there are thousands, thousands involved in it. There's a man recently, uh, somebody sent me a book, and there's a guy that's going around through the, the plain churches, the charity groups and so forth, and claiming to be a healer. And so I read the book, and it has, to me, there's red lights everywhere. Fraud, 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 as I read this book. And I even watch some of his teaching videos and stuff. I think the guy's a total fraud. He's either deceived or a deceiver, but it's fraud nonetheless. But there's a lot of people real interested. Wouldn't you like to be able to heal? Yeah, I'd love to be able to heal people. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? All these faith healers claiming to heal people, and yet we still have hospitals packed. You know, obviously there's a lot of shenanigans going on. The tongues movement. This guy, by the way, even though he's coming, he's coming with the idea of faith healing. Tongues is a necessary part of it. Okay? And if you read the way he talks about tongues, fraud is, is like neon signs. Okay? The idea is not that when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you will be able to speak to people about Jesus in another language. It'll just happen. That's not the idea. The idea is that when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will speak in a gibberish. And he admits that it doesn't come natural to everybody, but some of them need coached and helped and, and so forth so that they can, they can you know, bring that, that spiritual gift that's inside of them. He help, helps them to get it out. And sometimes, you know, it's hard for them to get started. So he, he kind of helps them along and gives them pointers how to get started. It's like fraud, fraud, fraud. But that's what we're dealing with, and that's what Paul was dealing with. And, if you keep in mind, in the pagan temples at Corinth, <clears throat> the pagan priestesses <clears throat> used ecstatic utterances while they were intoxicated, and it was interpreted to be a voice of the gods to the people. The oracles of the gods. The prostitute priestess would give the gibberish, somebody would interpret it, and this was, this was ooing and awing the pagan people, uh, because they were getting a message from the gods when they went to inquire at the oracles. Okay? And so, that's where it came from. God is not the author of confusion. Paul clearly said that. 
This that you're doing is confusion. God is not the author of it. Who's the author of it? The devil. The devil is the author of that confusion. And so, uh, any questions? Let's stand together. Any questions on uh, 1 Corinthians 14? Anything that was a comment that was made that maybe you didn't understand? It's pretty clear. Yeah, if you, if you use your brain and, and logic as you go through what Paul is saying, it's very practical, very logical, and it's a great shame that the Corinthians were allowing imposters to come in and ooh and awe them with a false spirituality. But you understand, these are the same people. We started chapter 12. Remember, you were led away unto these dumb idols. Remember what they used to do in the pagan temple? Why would he say that? Because it was the same stuff. All right.